In this lecture, we will review prenatal development and the newborn. First, let us talk about conception. Nothing is more natural than a species reproducing itself, and nothing is more wondrous. For you, the process started inside your grandmother as an egg formed inside a developing female inside of her. Your mother was born with all the immature eggs she could ever have. Your father, in contrast, began producing sperm cells nonstop at puberty. Sometime after puberty, your mother's ovary released a mature egg like space voyages approaching a huge planet, some 250 million deposited sperm began their frantic race upstream, approaching a cell 85,000 times their own size. The small number reaching the egg released digestive enzymes that ate away the egg's protective coating. The one winning sperm penetrated the coating and was welcomed in, the egg's surface blocking out the others. And within half a day, the egg nucleus and the sperm nucleus fused. The two became one. Consider it your most fortunate of moments. Among 250 million sperm, the one needed to make you, in combination with that one particular egg, won the race. And so it was for innumerable generations before us. Now let's move on to prenatal development. How many fertilized eggs, called zygotes, survived beyond the first two weeks? Well, it's fewer than half. But for us, good fortune prevailed. One cell became two, then four, each just like the first, until the cell division had produced some 100 identical cells within the first week. About 10 days after conception, the zygote attaches to the mother's uterine wall, beginning approximately 37 weeks of the closest human relationship. The zygote's inner cells become the embryo. Many of its outer cells become the placenta, the life link that transfers nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the embryo. Over the next six weeks, the embryo's organ begin to form and function. The heart begins to beat. After nine weeks after conception, an embryo looks unmistakably human, and it is now a fetus. During the six months, organs such as the stomach develop enough to give the fetus a good chance of surviving and thriving if born prematurely. At each prenatal stage, Genetic and environmental factors affect our development. By the sixth month, the fetus is responsive to sound. Microphone readings taken inside the uterus reveal that the fetus is exposed to the sound of its mother's muffled voice. Immediately after emerging from their underwater world, newborns prefer their mother's voice to another woman's or to their father's. In addition to transferring nutrients and oxygen from the mother to the fetus, the placenta screens out many harmful substances, but some slip by. Teratogens such as a virus and drugs can damage the embryo or fetus. Even light drinking or occasional binge drinking can affect the fetus's brain. Persistent 
heavy drinking puts the fetus at risk for a dangerously low birth weight, birth defects, future behavior problems, and lower intelligence. For one in about 700 children, the effects are visible as fetal alcohol syndrome, FAS, the most serious of all fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, marked by lifelong physical and mental abnormalities. The fetal damage may occur because alcohol has epigenetic effects. It leaves chemical marks on DNA that switch genes abnormally on or off. Smoking during pregnancy also leaves epigenetic scars that weaken infants' ability to handle stress. If a pregnant woman experiences extreme stress, the stress hormones flooding her body may indicate a survival threat to the fetus and produce an earlier delivery. Some stress early in life prepares us to cope with later adversity. But substantial prenatal stress exposure puts a child at increased risk for health problems such as hypertension, heart disease, obesity, and other psychiatric disorders. Now, let us review the birthing process. Childbirth occurs in three stages. The first stage, which lasts about 10 to 12 hours for a woman having her first child, is the longest stage. The cervix dilates to about 10 centimeters, which is about four inches, at the end of the first stage. The second stage begins when the baby's head starts to move through the cervix and ends with the baby's complete emergence. The third stage involves the delivery of the placenta after birth. Methods of delivery include medicated, natural or prepared, and a cesarean, also known as a C-section. Moving on to the postpartum period. The postpartum period is the period after childbirth or delivery. The period lasts for about six weeks or until the woman's body has completed its adjustment. Physical adjustments in the postpartum period include fatigue, Involution, which is the process by which the uterus returns to its pre-pregnant size five or six weeks after birth, and hormonal changes. Emotional fluctuations on the part of the mother are common in this period, and they can vary greatly from one mother to the next. Postpartum depression characterizes women who have such strong feelings of sadness, anxiety, or despair that they have trouble coping with daily tasks in the postpartum period. Postpartum depression occurs in about 10% of new mothers. The father also goes through a postpartum adjustment. Bonding is the formation of a close connection, especially a physical bond between parents and the newborn shortly after birth. Many hospitals now offer a room and in arrangement in which the baby remains in the mother's room most of the time during its hospital stay. However, if parents choose not to use this rumen arrangement, the weight of the research suggests that this decision will not harm the infant emotionally. Please view my next learning lecture on physical development and health, how body growth and change occurs throughout early childhood and brain development as well as sleep and health. Mm -hmm.